Well, let's do a quick review and get caught up on what we've covered so far. So in the previous chapter uh, in our unit of study 1.1 on electric force and electric field, uh, we spent a lot of time deriving equations that you can use to determine an expression for the electric field at various points near continuous distributions of charge. And we started out with a charged rod, and we asked the question, if there's some point P that sits at a distance of A from a uniformly charged rod of length L and total charge Q, what is an expression for the electric field here? Okay, so our solution depended on something that I'll be referring to as the brute force method. That's what we covered in Unit 1.1. And uh, the reason we call it brute force is it relies on the superposition principle. And it takes several steps to show how you can divide the total charge capital Q into several little bits dQ, each one contributing just a portion to the overall electric field, dE, and by summing up the result of every dQ, you get the overall result for the electric field. And we did that again for a charged ring. And in the same way, we divided the total charge Q into a bunch of little bits dQ. So whenever using this brute force method, we're always identifying some little element of charge we call dQ, and by the superposition principle, finding the overall electric field, essentially saying that the total electric field by the superposition principle is the sum of all the small contributions to the field. Uh, our dQ is not always in the shape of a little pixel. Uh, in the case of finding the electric field due to a charged disk, then our small elements of charge themselves were individual, really skinny rings of charge. So instead of a tiny pixel, our dQ is in the shape of a ring, and by adding up several rings, we can get the electric field for the entire disk. We did the brute force method by identifying a bunch of small elements of charge for a, um, a charged arc, and we can find the electric field at least at the center of curvature. We revisited the rod, and instead of finding the electric field at this point P, we came up with an expression for the electric, the electric field at this point, P. I think we defined this variable as Y. Well, in this chapter, instead of calling it Y, we'll call it R, and we'll end up with the same result. So we're going to return to two of these. We're going to use a different method aside from the brute force method to show that the electric field uh, at point P for a charged rod of this, source, of this sort uh, carries the same expression as the result we found using the brute force method. I believe we'll also use Gauss's law to find the electric field near a charged disk, provided that the distance here, uh, maybe we call this distance x, is much, much less than the radius of this charge, uh, charged disk r. Or we might change our minds and instead of saying this is a disk, we might say it's a sheet, really no different. What we're saying is we're a small distance out from a two-dimensionally charged surface as opposed to a one-dimensional rod. Yeah, and if the distance x is much, much less than any other dimension, whether we refer to the length or the width, uh, we can use Gauss's law to verify the same equation. So what is this Gauss's law I keep referring to? Well, I'll state it for you formally. I'm not sure it'll make much sense to see it, uh, and then we'll uh, break it down from there. So Gauss's law is written as a mathematical equation, and it says the integral of the vector dot product of electric field and little elements of vector area is equal to the charge that's uh, inside of something we call a Gaussian surface divided by a fundamental constant known as the permittivity of free space. The integral of E dot dA is equal to Q in over epsilon naught. Ooh, and this is a special integral. This is actually a closed surface integral. So we don't actually have some lower or upper limit. Instead, we say we integrate all the way around our Gaussian surface. 
This should all sound a bit mysterious for now, so don't feel bad if you're a bit lost. Right, this is our Gauss's law. Now, this entire left side of the equation is actually a way to calculate something known as electric flux. Electric flux is exactly what it looks like. It's a product of two quantities. It's a product of field strength, electric field strength in this case, and area. There's such thing as magnetic flux as well, which is the product of magnetic field strength and area. So uh, you've probably encountered a study of flux at some point in one of your previous math classes. So electric flux is found uh, any time electric field lines puncture a surface area, so to speak. So for example, if there was a sheet, uh, not unlike a sheet of notebook paper, that lied in the uh, XZ plane. Let me make a reference for you. The Y-axis and the X-axis are in the plane of this screen, and the Z-axis is in and out of this screen. So here I have a sheet that lies in the XZ plane. And then let's imagine an electric field that points entirely in the X direction and fills up all of space. Well, in this case, there is some electric field, and there's a length and a width to this sheet of paper, so it has some area. However, there's no flux in this case. Because the electric field lines aren't passing through, that would be more like if the electric field pointed in this direction and actually passed through the surface area, right? So let me draw. plane in a different orientation. So now our plane sits in the, uh, what would this be, in the YZ plane, right? And our electric field passes through the area. Again, we say the sheet has some length and some width. So in this case, our flux, ooh, and here's the symbol for flux. It's the capital Greek letter phi. If I put phi subscript E, I mean electric flux, and electric flux is equal to the field strength multiplied by the area. At least uh, that's what we get in magnitude in this case. Um, okay. What if... It's a bit tricky to draw this. Well, I'm not sure I've done that very well. Let me try again. So we'll say our electric field still points completely parallel to the x-axis, but instead of having the area lie in the xz plane or the yz plane, what if it's tilted at some angle relative to those planes? Something like this. Okay, well, I want you to imagine a vector that points normal to the, uh, to the area. Okay, so normal in the mathematical sense, meaning perpendicular. So if that's a vector that's exactly one unit long, then this is the uh, unit normal hat vector, right? And in this case, the vector points in this direction. Now notice, in case one, where the flux is zero, the normal vector is perpendicular to the electric field. And in the case where the flux was equal to the overall electric field strength and the total area, which, by the way, would just be length times width, in that case, the normal vector and the electric field are uh, entirely parallel to one another. Here we have a case where there's an angle between the normal vector and the electric field, and we can just label that angle as theta. So I can tell you that the 
electric flux is actually a um, vector product. Well, it's a scalar. Mm. It's a product of two vectors, and then itself is a scalar. Okay, so it's the dot product between the electric field and the area. So it's a little strange to think of area as a vector, right? What we're really saying is uh, we create an area vector by multiplying the scalar quantity known as area, which is just the product of length and width in this case, multiplied by the normal hat vector. So because this is a uh, unit vector, it doesn't change the value of the area, but it gives a direction to it. So the area vector is always normal or perpendicular to the surface. Well, what if we have something like, uh, how do I make this look like a sphere instead of a circle? How do I convince you this is three-dimensional? I think you're supposed to make some sort of symbol like that, and now it's supposed to look more 3D. Okay, and then what if I erase a portion of this? So we don't have a complete sphere, but we also don't have a flat sheet, right? We've got something like this. And there's electric field. penetrating that surface area. How are we going to calculate the amount of flux in this case? Is it just as simple as multiplying the surface area? If this is exactly half of a sphere, a hemisphere, uh, would the flux in this case just be the strength of the electric field multiplied by 1 half of 4 pi r squared? Isn't 4 pi r squared how we calculate the surface area of a complete sphere, so one-half because this is a hemisphere. Well, it turns out that would be incorrect. And the reason is, uh, let's break up the surface area into a bunch of little elements of surface area. So if this has a total area, 4 pi r squared, then this is just a little tiny uh, patchwork of the surface area, dA. Now, in this case, the angle between that little element of area's normal vector, or in other words, if that's a unit vector, one unit long, then this is the area vector found by multiplying the uh, scalar quantity of area times the unit normal vector. Anyway, the angle between the area vector and the electric field is equal to zero degrees. And dot products are always maximized when the angle is zero. In fact, you should recall that a way to calculate the dot product is to say it's the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of the area times the cosine of the angle between them. But in this case, there is no single uh, angle that defines how the electric field meets the surface at all points. In fact, if we make a little element of surface area here, a little patchwork, its area vector is going to point at this angle, and theta is most definitely not equal to zero degrees for that bit of it. And so you get the idea uh, we're going to divide up the area into a bunch of little bits. In that case, we have a much more general definition for the flux. The total flux is the summation of all the little contributions to the flux for each little patchwork of area. So in other words, I get it by summing up the electric field dot product with every little bit of area, right? So now you can see our definition for Gauss's law. If we go back, the equation we stated, now you recognize this as a way to calculate electric flux. So in a way, Gauss's law tells us that electric flux is directly proportional to the amount of charge, but what's this whole in question mark? And what in the world is this symbol doing on my integral sign? Well, in this example of the electric field passing through this hemisphere, there's just as much flux if I uh, were to close this off. Let me 
shade this in yellow and say that's actually not an opening. That's like a, um, well, it's as if I took a disk of radius r, and I used it as a lid, as a cap. And I used that to cover up this open part, right? We're looking at this hemisphere almost like if it were a soup bowl. This isn't an opening that allows me to pour in the soup. I've put a lid on it, and that's what this yellow shaded area represents. And then I will shade in orange, I guess, this portion. So we can see field lines come in and puncture the lid, so we say there's some inward flux, but then that very same field line continues and at some point has to come back out and it has to exit through the uh, curved portion of the hemisphere. So there's an inward flux that's canceled by the outward flux and um, for any completely closed surface, the net amount of flux is always going to equal zero provided that the electric field is entirely external. But Here's a different situation. What if we had, how about make it a complete sphere instead of a hemisphere? Show you again that this is three-dimensional. And what if it encloses a charge of Q? Well, then the electric field doesn't go both in and out of the surface. Here, the field lines go entirely out of the surface. That field line goes out of the surface, out of the surface, out, out. Ah, okay. So if some charge is enclosed by this imaginary surface, and by the way, that's what we mean now when we say a Gaussian surface. A Gaussian surface is just any imaginary surface you can think up that may or may not enclose some amount of charge. If charge is enclosed, there will be a net amount of flux, and Gauss's law tells us that that net amount of flux, see that? This is how a mathematician says net amount of flux. The net flux is proportional to this amount of charge that lies inside. Uh, if we want to change the proportional to equal, we say the net amount of flux is equal to a constant multiplied by the amount of charge enclosed. Actually, the charge enclosed divided by a constant. This constant is known as the permittivity of free space. I've referenced that in passing in our previous unit of study. And we'll say that the permittivity of free space is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per newton meter squared. Get used to that value. It's going to show up over and over again throughout the course of this semester. So uh, I've not gone far. I've not shown you the utility of Gauss's law, how we can apply this equation. And this concept of flux may still seem a bit mysterious. But for now, uh, consider this simply an introduction. And now you can answer the question, what is flux? Hey, thanks for watching.